Our speaker today is Charlotte Atten from the University of Rochester, and she will be talking on multiplayer rock, paper, scissors. Thank you, Charlotte. Go ahead. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, oh, so first of all, can everyone see where I wrote New York Combinatoric Seminar? Um, okay, fantastic. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking about a multiplayer version of rock, paper, scissors. And uh, for those of you, I think there are at least a couple in the audience who have listened to me talk about rock, paper, scissors before. Uh, this talk has a more combinatorial focus and will include things that I've never talked about in uh, any talk that you've seen before, I'm pretty sure. Okay, so, uh, oh, that's nice. It just clears for me, okay. Um, so uh, I always start the story about uh, my rock, paper, scissors project the same way. In the summer of 2017, I lived in a cave in Yosemite National Park. And while I was there, I wanted to explain to my friends that I study universal algebra. I realized that rock, paper, scissors was actually a particularly simple way to do that. And so uh, I'm gonna be thinking of rock, paper, scissors in three different ways simultaneously. Uh, I'm gonna be thinking of it as a game as an algebraic structure called a magma, which is a set with a single binary operation on it. And I'm also going to be thinking of it as a uh, sort of directed graph. And I'm going to be switching between all three of those perspectives <laughs> throughout the talk. Uh, so for anyone who hasn't ever been exposed to this before, uh, which I think is rare, but it happens, uh, rock, paper, scissors is a game where two players simultaneously choose one of uh, three items, which are rock, paper, and scissors. And then uh, based on which uh, pair of items were chosen by the players, uh, that tells us whether one player won um, and the other lost or whether they tie. If they choose the same item, they tie and no one wins or loses, uh, depending on your perspective. And, uh, and then uh, for the other items, uh, rock beats scissors, which beat paper, uh, which um, which beat rock, which beats rock. Okay, so we can actually view this game as a magma, which again is a set with a single binary operation, a single map taking pairs of elements of that set to other elements of that set, where f of x y is just defined to be the winning item from among x and y. So, for example. As I was saying, uh, paper beats rock. And so here we can see that rock times paper in this uh, magma multiplication gives us paper. And similarly uh, for the other things. So rock times rock is rock because we think of both players who chose rock as being winners, um, even though that's really a tie. All right, so I also realized that I wanted to be able to play with many of my friends at the same time. And this led me to study hyper tournaments and hyper tournament algebras. So, uh, for so for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be uh, first of all defining uh, rock paper scissors and pseudo rock paper scissors magmas, and then giving a numerical constraint relating the arity of these magmas with their order, and then finally, or well, finally, then I will uh, define. Uh, regular rock, paper, scissors, magmas. And then I will discuss hyper tournaments and how all of these things can be viewed as a sort of pointed hyper tournament. And finally, I'll discuss an embedding result for, uh, for hyper tournaments and some open questions that I have. I don't know that they'll be difficult open questions, but they're questions that I haven't addressed yet. So uh, what should it even mean to have a multiplayer version of the game rock, paper, scissors. Well, the game rock, paper, scissors, and I'll define all of these terms in a minute, is conservative, essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate. And these are the properties that we want for a multiplayer game also, or at least the properties that I want. OK, so what does a multiplayer game actually mean? Well, I'm going to. Uh, refer to an, a set A equipped with an n-ary operation as an n-ary magma. So this is just a set and some map that takes n tuples of A to A, where n is some fixed natural number. And I'm never going to consider n equals zero. That's that's not, not something I'm interested in. 
Uh, so the selection, okay, so then uh, any NRE magma can actually be viewed as a game. It can be viewed as a game that I call a selection game where uh, this game has n players, which we'll call p1, p2, through pn. Think of n people sitting at a table and they each have their, their place at the table. Each player, pi, simultaneously chooses some item, ai, from the collection of possible items, which is our underlying set a. And the winners of this selection game are all the players who choose f of a1, a2, up through an. So that's a pretty broad class of games, but uh, these are games in the game theoretic sense. And of course, I don't want just any uh, selection game. I want one with a bunch of special properties. So the first property that rock, paper, scissors has is conservativity. An operation taking n tuples of A to A, or an n area operation, is conservative when given any n tuple of things in A, we have that its image actually is in the set of elements uh, in this tuple. So a uh, conservative operation always picks out one of the arguments that it's fed, and that's the output. It doesn't have to be the same one. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a projection operation. It just has to pick one of these guys that were fed into it to begin with. So we say that uh, the magma is conservative uh, when each round has at least one winning player. So that's, uh, that's the motivation there. It's not much fun to play a game where most of the time nobody actually wins. Uh, that's, that's kind of silly. So our second property is essential polyadicity. We say that an operation is essentially polyadic when uh, there is a map taking subsets of A, this is the power set of A, to, uh, to A, which agrees with F uh, in this manner. So in other words, the operation F is essentially polyadic when its value actually only depends on the underlying set of arguments fed to it and not the order or the multiplicity of arguments, as long as at least one uh, appears. And so uh, this, uh, this property is doing a lot of work for us. It's telling us both that we don't have to keep track of the number of times each item was played, uh, only that at least one was played. And I want that because I find it annoying to have to sit there and count whether 45 or 46 people all chose scissors. That's excruciating. And, uh, and also it tells us that it doesn't matter what seat you have at the table. Um, any permutation of the positions of the players will, will still result in the same output. So you, you aren't doing any better by sitting at a different place at the table. The third property uh, that I would like is strong fairness. And uh, this is sort of the most uh, opaque to define, I suppose. Um, so the idea, I guess, before I say formally what it is, the idea is that each item should have the same chance of being the winning item when exactly k distinct items are chosen for any fixed natural number k that you choose. So for example, if I'm playing a game with 100 people and um, maybe 101 people and uh, I consider all of the possible situations where exactly 16 items are chosen, I want each item to have the same chance of being the winning item from among all of those situations. Note that this is not the same as saying each player has the same chance of winning in all of those situations just that each item has the same chance of being the winning item. So formally what this is saying is that if uh, this function f is my basic operation for my magma, then uh, the preimage of any two elements under um, this operation, in other words, all of the, the sets of tuples um, that give you that output, um, all of those should contain the same amount of tuples which have exactly k entries for any particular k where this set A sub K is all of the members of the set of N tuples over A, which have exactly K distinct components. The final property is just a non-degeneracy condition that I call non-degeneracy. Uh, we're going to say that an operation is F, or an operation is F, an operation F is non-degenerate when uh, its underlying set is, um, has cardinality at least N, where F is an N area operation. Oh, I'm sorry. Under the underlying set should have cardinality strictly greater than n. So 
Uh, this is just basically because if the underlying set has size at most n, then uh, all of the members of, um, of the n tuples of A, which have exactly size of A many components, have to have the same set of components. And then it's impossible to have essential polyadicity unless your uh, set is just the trivial one element set. And that sort of ruins everything I'd like to do. So uh, there are variants of rock, paper, scissors with more items that have been uh, played. Uh, the French version of rock, paper, scissors adds one more item, which is the well. Uh, so the uh, rock and the scissors fall into the well and therefore lose to it, but the uh, paper covers the well and hence defeats it, apparently. Uh, so this game is not strongly fair. Uh, some items have a better chance of winning than others, but it is conservative and essentially polyadic. There's also the recent variant called Rock, Paper, Scissors, Spock, Lizard. And this is conservative, essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate. So here there are two new items. One is uh, represented by B here for, for Spock, um, for Vulcan. And uh, then the L represents the lizard. And so this, this variant does have all of the properties I would like for a generalized rock, paper, scissors game. Although this one is still only for two players. Well, uh, our first little result is that uh, the only valid rock, paper, scissors variants for two players use an odd number of items. And so formally, uh, we can say this by saying that if we have a selection game A, uh, with this arity equal to two, which is essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate, then if M is the order of uh, this magma, the size of this underlying set of items, then uh, we have to have that that number of items is odd. And conversely, for each odd number of items, there does exist such a game. And I'm not gonna go through the whole argument, but essentially it comes down to that you need that M divides M choose two and that forces oddness, but when you have oddness, then you can also set up the situation that I just described. Uh, notice that actually we didn't need conservativity here. Uh, so uh, that particular axiom wasn't necessary to, to argue this. And this is something that in, um, there's a graph theory analog of this that's well known. This is, this is a sort of a well understood thing. Uh, okay. So now I'd like to define a, a pseudo rock, paper, scissors magma as an n-ary magma, which is essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate. So all of the conditions except for conservativity. Uh, when A is an n magma of some order m with these properties, I'll say A is a PRPS or pseudo RPS MN magma. And I'll also use those labels to indicate the classes. Now, it turns out that we can actually generalize the previous uh, statement that I discussed before to, uh, to NRA, the NRA situation, which would be like to N player games. So if we have an NRA or an N player, um, so if we have an NRA pseudo RPS magma of order M, which again, think uh, we have an N player game with M items uh, from which to choose, then if we denote by pi of m, this is uh, bar pi, uh, this, if we denote by pi of m the least prime dividing m, then we actually have to have that n is strictly less than, than pi of m. Or in other words, the number of players must be strictly less than the least prime dividing the number of items from among which we can choose. So, uh, and conversely, for each pair mn, um, where m is not one, I'm, also never gonna consider M equals one because that's trivial. Uh, if for each pair MN uh, with N strictly le less than bar pi of M, there does actually exist such a magma. And so the argument here is a little bit more involved, but it still is in the same spirit. And really what it comes down to is just that M divides um, each of these M choose two, M choose three, up through M choose N, each of these binomial coefficients. And that really comes from um, the strong fairness and also that, um, I mean, the other properties are also important as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's where those binomial coefficients are coming from. 
I need this item, I need each particular item to show up the same number of times when I just consider exactly k many items chosen from my original set. Okay, so now I'd like to talk about RPS magmas. If we have an NRA magma, which is conservative, essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate, then we're going to say that uh, that is an RPS magma. Um, so in other words, RPS magmas are conservative pseudo RPS magmas. And so then we'll have similar notation for uh, the collection of all um, RPS magmas of order M and arity N, which again, we can think of just like the class of all uh, such games, generalized rock, paper, scissors games with N items or with M, nah, with M items for N players. And uh, we'll also use those terms to indicate the classes. Uh, so both the original game of rock, paper, scissors and the game uh, rock, paper, scissors, Spock, lizard are RPS magmas. The French variant is not even a pseudo RPS magma um, because it's not strongly fair. Well, now I'd like to actually show you how to construct a game for three players since I was concerned with multiplayer versions of rock, paper, scissors, and I haven't shown you that such a thing. I Well, okay, I, I suppose that I've uh, shown you that something similar should exist, assuming that you believe that uh, that result that I stated before, um, because I did say that, that uh, pseudo RPS magmas had to exist of the appropriate um, arity and, and order. But I, I'm now going to actually show how to construct a game for three players. This is going to be a ternary RPS magma, so a three player game uh, where we have some underlying set A and uh, we can see from that result that if we need the number of players three to be strictly less than the least prime dividing the number of items, then uh, well we can't use we can't use three certainly since the least prime dividing three is three. We can't use four because then two would be the least prime dividing four, but five is okay. So five is the smallest number that's acceptable. Uh, so we're going to actually make use of the left addition action of. Uh, Z5, this is the uh, cyclic group of order five under um, the additive cyclic group of order five, not the five adic integers. Um, we're going to use the left addition action of this guy on itself. So we'll produce an operation that takes three tuples of things from Z mod five to other things in Z mod five, uh, which is essentially polyadic. And we're going to actually end up giving this the property that W plus F of X, Y, Z so W plus the winner from among X, Y, and Z is actually the winner from among W plus X, W plus Y, and W plus Z um, for any W that we choose. Uh, if it's possible to do that, then we only need to define F on a representative of each orbit of uh, Z mod five, choose one, choose two, choose and choose three under the action of Z mod five. Um, and that's, that's by, um, that's by the essential polyadicity of the operation. So uh, in order to write down the rules for this three player game, first I'm going to list the orbits of, uh, of Z mod five, choose one, choose two, and choose three under the action, um, the left addition action of Z mod five. So uh, here I have those orbits. The first orbit is just the orbit of the one sets. And then, um, so of course these really represent you know, the one set zero, the one set one and so forth. And similarly here, this is the two set zero one, which doesn't actually have an order and so on. Okay, so here are all of the orbits. There are five of them. Now we're going to choose a representative for each orbit, say the first one in each row of this table. So that's the, the easiest possible choice. I'll just take my representative to be the first, first thing I wrote down in this table. I mean, of course, there, it, this isn't canonical. I just chose to write, write down these representatives in this way. But um, if I've already drawn the table this way, I might as well make that choice. Now I have to choose from each, uh, from each one of these um, K sets, I have to choose a representative for each one of my representative K sets. Uh, so 
I have to actually choose uh, a representative that comes from a set. So for example, if I have 0, 1, 3, then I'm allowed to choose 0 as my, uh, my designated element. And I could have chosen 1 or 3, but not 2 or 4. And um, again, this is because this is supposed to be the winning item out of these three items. So I have to choose either 0, 1, or 3 to be the winner when 0, 1, and 3 are chosen by the three players. And similarly for the other ones. I could have chosen them to be all zeros, but uh, for some reason I chose this to be a 1, which I'm allowed to do. Now we're going to use the left addition action of Zmod 5 on itself to extend these choices to all uh, members of the 1, 2, and 3 sets in Zmod 5. And so, uh, for example, if I set 0, 1, 3 to go to um, 0, then adding 1, uh, I obtain the 3 set 1, 2, 4, but then adding 1 to 0, I get 1, and then so on and so forth. We can actually uh, read off a definition for this ternary operation taking triples from Zmod 5 to itself uh, from this table in the following way. So uh, an example should make this clear. We're taking the mapping that sends 2, 4 to 2, this, uh, this thing that I've drawn here to indicate that uh, f of any tuple that contains precisely the elements 2 and 4 should be 2. So f of 2, 4, 4 is 2, f of 4, 2, 4 is 2, and so on and so forth um, through all the possibilities. OK, I feel like I've been going a little fast. So at this point, are there any questions or comments? Um, I promise I will survive if there are. OK, I guess there aren't, so I will keep going. Uh, so now I've actually written out the Cayley table for this uh, three magma, uh, which we obtained from the choice F uh, that I just described. Of course, this really should be a, a five by five by five uh, array of numbers, but because uh, I'm sort of stuck in two dimensions here, I will split it up into five separate tables. So uh, in order to read this, if you would like to, uh, for example, this entry indicates that F of three for one is three. And actually by the symmetry, even if I had permuted the, the arguments, it would, it would have given me the same thing. So if you choose to read it slightly differently, you should still be okay. All right, so now I have a formal definition that um, is the construction that I just gave in that specific case. Um, I don't really want to belabor this too much because if you understood what I just did, then you essentially understand what this definition is saying. This is just listing out and labeling all of the choices that I just described making. Uh, so we start off with some uh, regular group action, uh, which remember is uh, an action which is transitive. Uh, so anything gets sent to, can get sent to anything else by the action. And it's also uh, free or fixed point free which means that the only, uh, the, only, the only elements which act trivially are the identity. Uh, so, okay, so if we have a regular group action of uh, uh, group G on some set, then, um, well, we can extend that action in a natural way to K sets in, um, in the set of elements of A. Um, and then, uh, and then we can um, do the same exact thing that we had just done in that example before. We can split, uh, we can split the K sets up into orbits. We can choose a representative of each orbit. And then from that representative, we can choose a particular element, which is the, should be the output of that collection of elements under the uh, desired operation. Um, so there is, there is one thing that is necessary in order for um, this to do what I want it to. Uh, we actually need that the extension of this action uh, to each of the K, to the each of the sets of k sets uh, is free um, for each k between one and n. So that's the one the one technicality that we need. It, otherwise, this is just describing the thing that I just did. 
Okay, so assuming that those extensions are free, then we actually have that all alpha action magmas are rock, paper, scissors magmas. Um, and I'm not going to argue that, but it, it, it is relatively straightforward. And uh, the place that we get strong fairness is actually that these extensions are free. That's what's going to guarantee us that, um, that fairness condition that I described before. All right, so uh, a regular RPS magma is then, uh, is then the following thing. If I have some uh, non-trivial finite group G and some N, which is, which is strictly smaller than the least prime dividing the order of G, uh, then I'm going to denote by Gn beta gamma, the left multiplication action N magma induced by those choices beta gamma, where beta gamma were just all of the choices of orbit representatives and then representatives from within each of those orbit representatives that I had chosen before. Um, so Gn beta gamma is just, is just the uh, alpha action magma corresponding to the regular action of the group on itself um, obtained by making some collection of valid choices as per the procedure that I showed you before. So I'm going to refer to such an RPS magma as a regular RPS magma. And now I'm definitely assuming that everything I'm talking about is finite. Uh, so I'm not going to worry about, I'm not going to worry about infinite groups. Okay, so I'm finally ready to start talking about hypergraphs. Well, a pointed hypergraph uh, for me is going to be a hypergraph. Uh, so with some set of vertices S and some set of edges uh, sigma, um, along with a map that takes edges to vertices, where for each edge, um, E in my set of edges sigma, uh, G of E is actually in E. And so uh, this is called the pointing of the hypergraph. And for example, if we had, uh, say if we had the usual uh, three vertex cycle viewed as a hypergraph, um, say by consisting of just all of the unordered pairs in um, some set, uh, say rock, paper, scissors, uh, choose two. Then uh, a pointing of uh, the hypergraph with these faces or these edges uh, would assign to each edge a particular element. And so for example, I could assign to the edge uh, rock, scissors. I could assign that, uh, say, rock since rock beats scissors. And I can view that as actually pointing this edge at, oh, not at, not at scissors, at rock. Uh, I can view that as pointing this edge at rock. Now, of course, in the higher dimensional situation, uh, this is not the same as putting an order on the, on the vertices. That's only a, a special thing that happens in the case that you're, you're looking at a, a graph or a one dimensional. Uh, complex. If I have if I have a uh, if I have an edge, or if I have an edge of my hypergraph that has three vertices, so like a two simplex, then this pointing would assign to say rock paper scissors a particular element rock, and so that's not the same as ordering the the edge. That's just uh, pointing the the edge at this one point, say rock. All right, now uh, I'm going to only really be considering a special kind of hypergraph, which I'll call the incomplete hypergraph on a set S. And so the edge set for this hypergraph uh, is just going to be uh, all of the S choose K for K between one and N. So in other words, these are all of the, uh, these are all of the at most N minus one dimensional faces on the uh, simplex of um, dimension size of S minus one. Oh, and I should mention that that S S uh, that S two is then going to be uh, just the complete graph on the complete graph on that set of vertices S where there are loops at all of the, the vertices. Oh, assuming that you view a loop as being a, a, an edge with a single element in it. 
right? So then, and, and hyper tournament for me, and I apologize for anyone who studies hyper tournaments here because this is not, this is not uh, what is usually referred to as a hyper tournament in the literature, um, but this is what worked for me in this context and it generalized the correspondence um, between tournaments and, uh, and magmas that existed uh, previously. In, in algebra. So um, an N hyper tournament for me is a pointed hypergraph, uh, bold T, which consists of, uh, which consists of a tournament um, where of the form uh, SN for some set S, and then uh, a pointing uh, G that can just be an arbitrary pointing. So that's an N hyper tournament for me. And if you look at what this says in the n equals two case, um, then you will, then you will actually get, um, you will actually get a, a, a one-dimensional uh, graph tournament in the usual sense. So uh, in this in this example here uh, of the um, three-player game I constructed with five items to choose from, uh, we have a uh, table here that lists out all of the K sets for K equals one, two, or three, and then what the corresponding uh, pointing of those K sets is. And so this is also the data that we need to define a corresponding uh, three hyper tournament in this case. And so you can probably see from this example that the data that I needed to define uh, to define a three player RPS magma was actually precisely the same data just presented slightly differently that I need to define a, uh, a three hyper tournament. Now, of course, I can go back and forth between these two concepts. If I have an N hyper tournament, then I can obtain a hyper tournament magma uh, by uh, constructing an N magma A, where uh, for any collection of elements of my tournament, I'm going to define f of u1 up through un to just be the pointing of the edge containing the vertices u1 up through un, which is which could be of any size between one and n. So I could have equivalently actually defined a hyper tournament magma to just be an n magma, which is conservative and essentially polyadic. So algebraically, that's the same. That's the same type of object. Uh, so tournaments, which would be the n equals two case of a hyper tournament, as I've defined it, uh, have been studied for a long time. Uh, Hederlin and Schwadel introduced the n equals two case in 1965. And uh, there's been a lot of work in the intersection of universal algebra and uh, combinatorics on varieties generated by tournament magmas. Uh, so I actually found uh, the survey by uh, Svenkovich uh, and at all very helpful in uh, writing this paper on rock, paper, scissors. Uh, there are algebraic motivations for everything I'm going to do from now on, but I won't get into them right now. I just want to throw it out there that, that some of this is actually algebraically motivated, but it's still going to be nice on its own, I think. Uh, so I'd like to talk about an embedding result for these hyper tournaments. Uh, so first of all, let's consider this really nice class of hyper tournaments. Uh, uh, we're going to say that a hyper tournament is a regular balanced hyper tournament when that hyper when the hyper tournament magma for this tournament is a regular rock paper scissors magma. So these are just the tournaments, the hyper tournaments that correspond to regular rock paper scissors magmas, which are the ones that are constructed by that group action uh, construction that I described before. Uh, and those, I guess I should mention, those are not all possible RPS magmas. There are RPS magmas which are not regular. Uh, so it would be very nice if each finite n hyper tournament embedded into a finite regular balanced hyper tournament. Uh, and this turns out to be the case. That's, I don't know uh, whether or not that seems um, plausible at first glance, um, but uh, it can be done, and I will now show you how. 
So in order to do that, I'm going to need to uh, actually present uh, regular RPS magmas in a slightly different way. Um, that's maybe a slightly more sophisticated way of looking at them. So uh, first note that in the binary case, uh, this regular RPS magma, so some group G, um, this two just indicates binary. And then for these choices, beta and gamma of orbit representatives and then elements from each of those representatives, uh, we have that um, F of the identity and some element X is the same thing as X times F of X inverse E, where now I'm using multiplicative notation as opposed to the additive notation I was using before. So, uh, as, as we would say in, in uh, the case of uh, tournament graphs or tournament die graphs, either E has to dominate X or E has to dominate X inverse. And exactly one of those has to take place. So either E beats X or E beats X inverse, exactly one of those has to hold. So then note that the orbit of a pair of elements X, Y under the regular action of a group on itself um, contains uh, the identity uh, paired with some X inverse Y and, uh, okay, yeah, so this, this orbit contains um, the identity paired uh, with this guy and also, um, oh, I've, I've lost my braces here. <laughs> okay, yes. So the orbit of XY contains the identity paired with X inverse Y and also the identity paired with Y inverse X, which are inverses. We need, uh, we need only to find a map uh, lambda specifying for each pair of inverses uh, whether E dominates X or E dominates X inverse in order to specify uh, all of these choices beta gamma. So it turns out that that, that is actually precisely the, the data that's necessary. So we can think of this uh, we can think of this choice uh, function lambda selecting from each pair x, x inverse, uh, which one E dominates, as choosing the positive direction with respect to x and x inverse. Oh, and uh, in case you're, you're worried for a second, remember that uh, RPS magmas have to have odd order. And so we can't have any weird order two elements obstructing us from choosing from among the two distinct uh, elements X and X inverse. Now, I need to do this not for two pairs of elements, but for K sets of elements in a group. So I'm going to need a, uh, I'm going to need an analogous thing um, for K sets where uh, this is going to be sort of an anary analog of inverse elements uh, for, for a group element. Um, and so I call these things obverses. So if we have uh, some finite group um, and some n where n is smaller than the least prime dividing the order of the group, and we choose some k between 1 and n minus 1, and take k sets of non-identity elements in the group, say u and v, we're going to say that v is an obverse of u um, when it's possible to pick one element out of u, say ai, and then multiply the others by ai inverse and then toss in AI inverse itself, and that will give us V. So if it's possible to start with U, perform this process for some AI, and then get V, that's what it means for U and V to be um, obverse case adds. So the set of obverses, so ob U is the set of uh, all obverses V of U, as well as U itself. So we're just going to also declare that U is an obverse case out of itself or well, maybe not an obverse K set, but it's, it's, going to, it's going to be in the set of obverses for convenience. So uh, the obverses of a set U are uh, the non-identity elements in, um, yeah, in, the, in the members of the orbit of uh, U along with the identity, uh, which are not just um, the set U union with the identity, which contain the identity. So in order to specify uh, in order to specify a regular rock paper scissors magma, it suffices to choose a member of each collection of obverses uh, for which the identity dominates that collection. 
And so I'm going to call such a choice among um, for each collection of adverses an n sine function. So uh, this is going to be um, so an n sine function is going to be a choice function on the collection of all adverses for any um, for any possible collection of adverses that we could form uh, up to size at most n minus one. And uh, and so then uh, we're going to refer to um, a member of this as an n sine function, as I think I just I just said as well. Um, and so we'll write gn lambda instead of gn beta gamma to refer to uh, gn as just being constructed from the sine function. And I'm definitely uh, gliding over some details, but it turns out that these things are these things are equivalent, and this is a much cleaner way to present um, a regular RPS magma or its corresponding turn hyper tournament. Uh, now we can finally give this embedding result, which says that any finite hyper tournament with no other constraints on it can be embedded into a finite regular balanced hyper tournament, which is one that comes from an RPS magma. So uh, take T to be some finite hyper tournament. The group I'm going to use is, uh, is the direct sum of uh, cyclic groups whose orders are alpha u, um, where uh, this out, okay, so where um, this alpha u has to have the property that n is strictly less than the least prime um, dividing alpha u, and this is possible to accomplish. I'll, I'll give examples in a little bit. Um, so uh, we're then going to take an n sine function lambda uh, for this group, which have which have to exist as well, uh, and uh, well, just because they're choice functions, I mean that's not really technical. Um, okay, so then uh, we're going to define uh, for when the pointing of this k set u one through u k is u one, which you can relabel so that this is always the situation. Uh, we're going to define that the uh, the sine function on this uh, set of obverses of all of the uh, collection of ui minus u1, where i is not one, the collection of all the differences, the, uh, the element that we choose the identity to dominate is, uh, is, this, is this collection. And so it turns out that this is actually a well-defined map and, um, and that the n hyper tournament corresponding to this gn lambda for this particular choice of lambda has to contain a copy of, of the hyper tournament t. And any, any values might be chosen for the other orbits. There are other orbits, but it's impossible for these choices that I've described here to interfere with each other. And so if you want a specific class of finite regular balanced hyper tournaments, in which any finite hyper tournament embeds. Oh, sometimes I write tournament, but of course I mean hyper tournament. I just get tired of saying hyper all the time. Uh, we, oh, we need only use magmas of the form G and lambda, where G is either uh, uh, G is either, I guess, a vector space over a finite field is is a nice way of putting it. Um, so G is the nth direct power of uh, some uh, Z mod kappa of N, where N is kappa of N is the least prime strictly greater than N. So that's one choice uh, is as vector spaces over finite fields, if you want to be prosaic. So assigning a direction to each possible uh, vac non-zero vector in those spaces. Um, or the other choice we have are just cyclic groups of the appropriate order. So what we can do is we can take uh, our group to be Z mod alpha of M, where alpha of M is the product of all of the primes of the appropriate number of primes, starting with the prime that is uh, the, least, the least prime greater than, uh, strictly greater than N. So uh, we can also actually produce a cyclic group um, by just choosing a bunch of different primes, starting with the next biggest one past M, past N. All right, so uh, in particular, every tournament of order M, and so here I do actually mean binary, 
a binary tournament, so two, two tournament embeds into the tournament corresponding to some regular RPS magma of the form Z mod three to the M two lambda. So this tells us that any tournament of order M embeds into some balanced tournament of order three to the M. Well, uh, so uh, now I wanna talk about how optimal that is. So first of all, I never defined what a balanced hyper tournament was. I just told you what a regular balanced hyper tournament was. Uh, we're gonna say that a hyper tournament is balanced when the hyper tournament magma of T is just an RPS magma. So we're dropping the regular group action construction, but we're leaving on that strong fairness and the other properties as well. Well, if we let uh, H sub N of M denote the least natural so that each N hyper tournament of order M is contained as in can be embedded in some balanced N hyper tournament of order H N of M, then our previous observation is that H two of M is at most three to the M, that you can always fit every uh, two airy hyper tournament, which is just the usual tournament of order M into some uh, hyper, some tournament of order three to the M. You might have to use different tournaments of order three to the M for different uh, tournaments of order M, but some tournament of three to the M, of order three to the M will suffice. We can actually do much better than this. So uh, every tournament of order M actually embeds into a balanced tournament of order two M plus one. And so this is much better than three to the M. And I'm going to argue this to you by way of an example. So let's say that I want to uh, start off with this, with this tournament where, uh, let's say I have this. So this is not a balanced tournament. This is just some tournament on three vertices, which I will call A, B, and C. I need to construct a balanced tournament. So that's a tournament where every vertex has the same out degree and in degree. That's equivalent to what I defined previously. Um, and so in order to do that, what I'm going to do is perform a doubling construction. So I'm gonna write another copy of this tournament over here with the same dominance relation. So we're still going to have that uh, A dominates B, uh, B dominates C, oh. and A dominates C. And then I'm gonna label each of these guys to distinguish them. These, this is the one copy, this is the two copy. And so then uh, I'm going to add in one new vertex, which I call eta. And then I'm gonna do the following thing. Since B1 dominates C1, I'm going to have its partner C2 dominate B1. And then similarly, since A1 dominates B1, B1 gets to dominate a2, which is the partner of A1. And so either you're dominated in the first copy and you dominate the partner in the second one or you're, or vice versa. Okay, so now I still have to resolve um, whether B1 dominates B2 or vice versa. And so uh, no matter what I choose, one of them will, will have a bigger out degree than the other one. And so that's where this extra vertex eta comes in. So then if I'm going to look at B2, I'll, or B1 and B2, I'll say choose that B1 dominates B2, but then B2 will dominate eta, which makes up for that. And then eta in turn dominates B1. Now, of course, I haven't drawn in the edges, but I've described at this point, everything that needs to be done to the vertex B1. And you can imagine that you could do the analogous thing for every other vertex and that this is actually true in general. Um, so one can actually show by example that H2 of M is at least 2M minus one. Um, there's an example that you can see it has to be at least this much. And a similar construction to the one I gave previously, just which is just slightly more clever than that, uh, shows that um, H2 of M is actually a most 2M minus one. And so uh, H2 of M is precisely 2M minus one. That's, that's the exact value. 
Um, I only produced the construction uh, given for general hypertournaments once I found that I couldn't see how to generalize the doubling construction from the n equals 2 case. It, there's just too much going on. I, I couldn't see how to generalize that. It would be really interesting to know whether the argument I gave in the n equals 2 case can generalize to the higher arities. Uh, by the general embedding result, we know that Hn of m is at most kappa of n, where remember this is the least prime strictly greater than n uh, to the mth power. And so again, this is, you know, this is those parentheses are there. Um, so uh, for n strictly greater than two, is this the best bound possible? And actually, since I ended up doing this right uh, at the end of this project, I haven't really thought too much about, are, are there even some easy examples like in the n equals two case, which give a lower bound? The obvious choice would be a, an n hyper tournament where a single vertex dominates every other collection of vertices. Or in other words, that the pointing function is just a constant, a constant value function. Um, yeah, but I, I don't, uh, oh, actually, well, okay, it can't be a constant value function. I'm sorry, now I'm thinking about this more. Yeah, the, but okay, there is some analogous trivial example to the one that I have in mind, um, but I'm not sure what the bound is that it gives. All right, so I suppose uh, this is where I will stop. Um, thank you very much uh, for your attention. Let's thank the speaker. Hey, thank you, thank you. Hey. I will stop the recording and we'll take questions.